After World War II, communism was given a new lease of life thanks to the Red Army's victory. But Nazi barbarity masked the crimes of Stalin. The reputation of French and Italian communist parties had grown, bathed in the glory of the resistance movement. In Eastern Europe, Stalin advanced his pawns. In Budapest, Warsaw, and Prague, the USSR imposed its political and economic model. In 1949, Mao seized power in Beijing. From the River Elbe to the China Sea, half the world's population lived under the red flag. Communism was an irresistible, unstoppable force. The West was terrified of the Red Menace. The Cold War had divided the world into two blocks. The USSR had a new enemy in the shape of America. In the early 50s, the movement reached its peak. When Stalin died in March 1953, the Red Church had never had so many believers. Even the death of Stalin could not halt the expansion of communism. In May 1954, after seven years of guerrilla warfare, knee-deep in mud and horror, the French garrison at Dien Bien Phu surrendered. In the eyes of the world, this battle represented the conflict between the East and the West. The flag of the Viet Minh flying above the ruins of Dien Bien Phu symbolized socialist expansion into Asia. North Vietnam passed into the hands of Ho Chi Minh. This was just the first step for the Vietnamese communists. In Moscow, the race to become Stalin's successor was heating up. Who would it be? Malenkov, Beria, Molotov, Boganin, or the jocular Khrushchev? They all looked the same, those men in gray, those accomplices to Stalin's crimes, who had climbed to the top during the Great Terror. But now, they were convinced it was high time repression stopped and the regime changed. <laughs> Cracks started appearing around the edges of the Soviet Empire, showing it was indeed time for change. The first crack appeared in East Berlin. In June 1953, the city's workers rose up against enforced price rises and demanded free elections. It marked the first popular uprising against communism for 30 years. Soviet tanks crushed the demonstrations. 19 leaders were rounded up and executed. The silence from the West was deafening. Over several months, Nikita Khrushchev managed to eliminate all rivals. Khrushchev moved shrewdly between factions, gradually establishing his power base. He soon had enough support to undertake his first feat as leader.
The reconciliation with Tito, who had been accused of fascism five years earlier, was a turning point in communist history. For the first time, believers were allowed to admit that errors had been made by the great Stalin. But bear-hugging Tito was just a starter. The 1,400 delegates from the 55 brother parties that attended the opening of the 20th Congress on February 14, 1956, had no idea of what they were about to witness. The Congress started with the usual formalities, followed by a minute's silence for Stalin. Then new first secretary Khrushchev presented a report which underlined the important changes being made to party policy. On February 24th, it was announced that an extraordinary meeting would be held behind closed doors that very night. During the meeting, Khrushchev read a document he had commissioned from historians. The leaders of foreign parties were excluded from the hall. Toliati and Torres, among others, heard the contents of what was to become known as the Khrushchev Report during the night. In this top secret report, First Secretary Khrushchev had listed Stalin's crimes the Red Army Purge, the fixed trials, and the liquidation of millions of Soviet citizens. He gave a portrait of a bloodthirsty tyrant building up his own personality cult. Khrushchev denounced the crimes, taking care to attribute them to Stalin alone. By criticizing the man and his cult, Khrushchev exonerated the party from any collective responsibility. In the USSR, the report was printed and distributed. Within a few weeks, millions of Soviets had read it. In the West, the report was leaked and published in the press in June. The French Communist Party refused to recognize the authenticity of the text, supposedly from Comrade Khrushchev. Maurice Torres said there was nothing to learn from the report and the questions it raised. He was well aware the system was based on certitude. The slightest doubt would prove fatal. In Italy, however, Togliatti decided, after careful consideration, to release the Khrushchev report and to announce a slow reform policy. After years of towing the Moscow party line, the Italian communist leader stated that from then on, each party would have to find its own way, what he called polycentrism. The era of unconditional adherence was over. Moscow was no longer the center of the world. While Torres refused destalinization, Togliatti applied it. The split between the two biggest parties in Western Europe had just begun. The Khrushchev report had unleashed a political storm. Although not the full list of crimes, its existence was explosive. Khrushchev was the first communist to denounce the evil deeds of communism. A pillar of the faith had crumbled. Reaction to the report and the 20th Congress was strongest in Eastern Europe. In Hungary, disgust turned into revolt. The symbols of communism were torn down or attacked, from Stalin's statue to the political police. The insurgents set up committees demanding free elections and liberty. The 
Russian tanks intervene and crush the uprising, claiming the defense of socialism against the fascist threat. Street battles left thousands of victims. Repression was swift and efficient. From then on, the threat of the Red Army put an end to any hopes of independence in the satellite states. The brutal intervention in Budapest distanced many of the parties in the West and provoked mass resignation of membership. But this didn't stop the French Communist Party from supporting the action taken by the Red Army. In Paris, demonstrators attacked their headquarters of l'Humanité and the Central Committee. Respite for the party, which took advantage of the situation to preach to its members the simplistic sermon of good against evil. This propaganda film confirmed the Russian theory. In Paris, like in Budapest, those that attack communism must be fascist. November 56. La lueur blafarde de l'incendie allumé en Hongrie a fait croire un moment à la réaction que le socialisme allait être abattu. Mais l'Union soviétique a mis un terme à cet espoir. Défenseurs de la liberté et du socialisme, ceci, non. Élément abreuvé de propagande anticommuniste et entraîné par des fascistes semblables à ceux contre lesquels l'Union soviétique est intervenue en Hongrie et qui s'apprêtait à ranimer le spectre de la guerre au cœur de l'Europe. For the USSR, the Khrushchev era was a time of thaw. The youth woke up from its long hibernation. Khrushchev wanted to get back to basics. He proposed a new communist utopia, a new challenge in the east of the country. Harking back to the mystique of the huge public works of the 30s, he launched an ambitious program to develop virgin land. 300,000 young men and women, chosen as volunteers, set off to conquer Siberia. The land of the Gulag became land of the pioneers. In 1956, the gates of the camps were opened. Millions of Zeks were set free. The end of the terror was a sure sign of a new era. Once again, people could walk, talk, and sleep without fearing the dawn raids. <laughs> Academics and artists began to believe times were changing. <laughs> Khrushchev himself authorized publication of One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, the story of a gulag prisoner. He even met author Alexander Solzhenitsyn. In September 1959, Khrushchev made the first ever state visit by a Soviet premier to the United States. This new Pacific coexistence helped change the image of the Kremlin. Russians were no longer seen with knives between their teeth. 
When presenting Eisenhower with the model of the recently launched Sputnik, Khrushchev promised him, your grandchildren will live under communism. When Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space, communists around the world felt great pride. This first step for mankind showed the October Revolution was still alive and kicking. The conquest of space, the taming of the cosmos, was symbolic of how inventive communists could be. Gagarin was the new smiling hero who could mask the crimes of the KGB. The Chinese had not accepted destalinization. Mao, the supreme ideologist, knew that the personality cult of a leader was the cornerstone of the faith. After the 20th Congress, Chinese communists continued to venerate the name of Stalin. In Red China, Mao launched a great leap forward, a utopian policy designed to catch up with capitalist countries in 15 years. Based on voluntarism and productivity in small workers' communities, the policy was an economic disaster. Crop failures led to a terrible famine, which had 30 million victims in just a few years. The West knew little of the extent of the disaster. Like in the Soviet Union one generation before, the gap between the real and the imaginary was huge. Maoist China was a celebration of youthful vigor, ready to attack their Herculean task of bringing the country into the 20th century. The revolutionary message had not lost its charm. When Khrushchev visited Beijing in 1959, the meeting appeared friendly enough as the two giants toasted the communist movement. The truth was, Mao had rejected Moscow's leadership. China demanded equal status in running world communism. Mao saw himself at the helm of a pure, stricter, more intransigent religion. Over the next few months, tension mounted. Talks went from friendly to confrontational. Khrushchev repatriated the Soviet advisors and refused to help Mao build atomic weapons. The break was final. The split with China meant that there was no longer one church founded on only one gospel. From then on, no one party was the keeper of the sacred word. Communism now had two capitals. In January 1959, Fidel Castro entered Havana and wrote himself into 20th century legend. The epic journey of his band of Barbudos from the Sierra fit the revolutionary mythology. At first, there were just a dozen men left over from a failed landing.
After two years of guerrilla warfare, they finally ousted Batista, head of the corrupt regime. With their olive fatigues, scruffy beards, and ever-present cigars pointing in defiance at neighboring America, Castro, Che Guevara, and the other commandantes epitomized youthful, radical intransigence. Along with Petrograd 1917 and Beijing 1949, they gave the name of Havana, a place in the revolutionary pantheon. The message throughout Latin America was simple. They armed themselves and took power. Revolution is possible, you just have to want it enough. He promises his people freedom. Che Guevara summed up Castro's voluntarism. The duty of all revolutionaries is to revolt. Viva la revolución, viva la reforma agraria, viva Fidel Castro Ruz. En un tiempo se vivía oprimidos y sufriendo sin poder decir verdades. Hasta el noble campesino que sufría su pobreza lleno de necesidades. Pero ahora todo es nuevo en los campos y ciudades todos gritan muy contentos. Viva la revolución, viva la reforma agraria, viva Fidel Castro Ruz. Castro decreed agricultural reform and redistributed the land among the peasants. Viva Camilo en la historia. The shockwave from the Cuban Revolution was felt everywhere. Havana became the new revolutionary Mecca, visited by pilgrims from around the globe. Jean-Paul Sartre was encouraged by the storm that swept through the sugar cane. Even the leaders rolled up their sleeves and got down to work. Cuba nationalized the large American companies. But the Cuban fiesta was short-lived. The USA stopped purchasing Cuban sugar. The Russians came to the rescue supplying oil and arms. In a matter of months, post-revolution Cuba had become a Soviet satellite. Khrushchev turned the island into an aircraft carrier, installing, with Castro's agreement, nuclear-capable warheads pointed at the U.S. In autumn 1962, the missile crisis sent the world to the brink of apocalypse. When several months later, Castro visited the USSR, the Sovietization of Cuba was complete. The Caribbean island was in Moscow's hands. But Castro's coup had planted the idea of revolution firmly into the Latin American psyche. On his 70th birthday, Khrushchev was decorated by Leonid Brezhnev. It was the kiss of death. Brezhnev and his acolytes had already decided to ooze Khrushchev. The split with Mao, the failure of economic reform, his backing down from Kennedy over Cuba were all blemishes on Khrushchev's CV in the eyes of the Politburo. What Khrushchev had done was to put an end to the terror. By doing so, he had unwittingly planted the seeds of doubt and revolt in the satellite states, especially in Czechoslovakia. Censura přestala, přátelé, existovat. Hurá! Je to obrovský pokrok, naposledy jsme ho dosáhli přesně před 50 lety. Spousta lidí teď samozřejmě bude bez zaměstnání, ale myslím si, že... Myslím si, že svoboda slova v civilizovaném státě je úplně to základní. 
protože je nelogické, aby se člověk tak dlouho učil mluvit a pak nesměl mluvit. Dubček represented the liberal arm of communism. As the new general secretary of the party, he wanted to implement reform from the top, loosen the screws, wipe out the Stalinist past, and give a voice to the people. For a while, the spring uprising in Prague gave the illusion that socialism could have a human face. But the Soviets did not even give Dubček enough time to implement a single reform. In August, the tanks of the same Red Army that had liberated the city from the Nazis rolled in to imprison it. Reform of the communist system was impossible. Either the steps for democratization were too tentative and changed nothing, or they put the role of party leaders into doubt, which was something that Dogma and the Red Army would not tolerate. After the spring thaw in Prague, the communist parties in the West moved away from Moscow. A decision easier to make now that the old guard of the Comintern era had gone. Torres and Togliatti, the two charismatic leaders of French and Italian communism, had both died in the summer of 1964. The symbolism of the coincidence escaped nobody. They both died in the USSR for so long their promised land. At the funeral of the two T's, a whole era of communism was buried with them. Of course, it was the era of Stalin and subordination to Moscow, but for the militant, it was also the era of the great struggles against fascism and colonialism and the class war. The successors, who were brought up during the peak of communism, were faced with a huge reversal. In France, Val des Crochets initiated a strategic alliance with the socialists. In Italy, the young Enrico Berlinguer spoke out in confirmation of his party's autonomy from Moscow. The quest for pure communism and self-sacrifice was taking place far from Moscow, in much warmer climes. The hope for world change was symbolized by new idols. The icons of the Kremlin were fast becoming old-fashioned. An archangel-like, asthmatic, Argentinian doctor named Ernesto Guevara was the biggest idol of them all. When he left for Bolivia to plant the seeds of revolution, Che Guevara reached the end of his quest. His revolutionary passion had raised him to Christ-like proportions.
young people across Latin America took up arms shouting victory or death. But most hopes of victory were dashed, blindfolded, and shot against the wall at dawn. The real alternative to Moscow was Beijing. To consolidate his power, Mao launched a cultural revolution. In 1966, he sent the Red Guard, made up of millions of students across the country, to spread the word of the Little Red Book. the Red Guards were soon out of control. They targeted party directors and the symbols of the past. For three years, China was plunged into violence. Yet, many in the West saw the Cultural Revolution as a reaction to the stagnation of the party, an appeal to the mass proletariat to regenerate communism. The Cultural Revolution caused millions of deaths, and Mao was obliged to call in the army to restore order. In 1969, the parade for the 20th anniversary of the revolution went back to being a military march past. In fact, China was in dire straits. The youth was disoriented and the economy in ruins. The purges and power struggles that followed Mao's death in 1976 signaled the end of Chinese communism's allure. Meanwhile, in the rice paddies in Indochina, another page in history was being written in Nepal. Vietnam was fighting for communism against the all-powerful U.S. Army. As Charlie, in his black pajamas, fired at supersonic military aircraft with his rusty old rifle, he seemed to be fighting for the whole planet. In Tokyo, Rome, Berlin, Paris, or at Berkeley, the struggle of the Vietnamese against the economic and military might of the U.S. was the very symbol of revolt. Vietnam incarnated the suffering of everyone across the globe, the hopes of all the downtrodden. Never had the cause of war been so clear-cut. The taking of Saigon by North Vietnamese troops was seen as a victory against the imperialist Yankee. It 
It didn't take long for the illusion to be destroyed by the harsh reality. The Vietnamese communists were, after all, communists that imposed the same one-party system, centralized economy, and political control of the population. The images of thousands of Vietnamese boat people fleeing the re-education camps to risk their lives on the China Sea at the mercy of the elements and sea pirates put paid to any dying illusions. A few months later, worse was to come when the horrors of the Cambodian killing fields were revealed, chilling to the bone all those who had celebrated victory in Phnom Penh. The Third World Revolution collapsed dramatically in crime. The idols of the 60s, Castro, Mao, Ho Chi Minh, were just vestiges of bygone hopes. Traumatized by the crushing of the Prague Spring uprising, opposed to the radical leftism of the Third World, the large Western Communist parties entered the 70s disoriented. They found themselves unable to answer certain questions. How could they claim to be revolutionaries without preaching revolution? How could they offer an alternative society when the society they had drawn up as a model was now despised and discredited? Chacun de vous a entre les mains le projet de résolution soumis par le comité central du Parti communiste à la discussion de toutes nos And yet, in France and Italy, communists looking for a new way took the initiative, reintegrated themselves into politics, and plan for government. Enrico Bellinger brought party policy more in line with the Italian socialists. The strategy worked, as in the next election, the Communist Party snatched up a third of the votes. Che adesso vi presenterò l'onorevole Enrico Bellinger. Comunista garantito! Comunista garantito! Io vorrei prenderlo in collo, ma lui non si farà prendere. Sarebbe un mio sogno prendere in collo per l'inguer. Per andare al socialismo, ho definito nel progetto di document la façon dont on veut y aller. On veut une voie démocratique. C'est 
The price for a role in government was to abandon the dogma that had been the basis of communism's identity for 20 years. Et c'est pour ça qu'il y a un lien entre la voie qu'on a choisie et la suppression du terme « dictature du prolétariat ». Only one party in Europe refused change, the Portuguese Communist Party. After 40 years of clandestinity, during the dictatorship, it stuck to the party line of the 30s. Power would be won on the street, the socialist were the enemy. Following the Carnation Revolution of 1974 and urged on by Moscow, the communists mobilized. Although the context of Western Europe was hardly right for the repeat of Petrograd 1917, it didn't stop this old country from dreaming of revolution. Enrico Berlinguer was taking the Italian Communist Party further and further away from Moscow. To lend credibility to their conversion to bourgeois democracy, the French and Italian parties voiced their criticism of the people's democracies of Eastern Europe. Occorre che con audacia e con intelligenza ci si sappia liberare da ogni scolastica applicazione della nostra dottrina intesa come dogma e da orientamenti che non sono più adeguati all'esperienza e alle condizioni storiche attuali per camminare verso vie nuove. In fact, the Italian Communist Party was giving its support to those in Russia, Poland or Czechoslovakia who opposed their repressive regimes. The emblematic figure of resistance was Solzhenitsyn, who was exiled once again for smuggling the manuscript for his book, The Gulag Archipelago, into the West. The publication of this book sent an ideological shockwave around the globe. The totalitarian nature of the communist system, exposed by Solzhenitsyn, caused a complete collapse in the faith. But it was in Poland that the real collapse started, when the workers of the Gdansk shipyards went on strike in the summer of 1980. They didn't realize they just had unleashed the unstoppable force. This time, the revolt wasn't led by a handful of intellectuals like in Budapest and Prague, but by the working class itself. The Polish Communist Party was forced to negotiate with Lech Walesa and to take the unprecedented step of recognizing an independent trade union. The proletariat in whose name the communists were running the country was now organized and committed. In December 1981, the Polish army intervened. A state of war was decreed and the leaders of Solidarność were imprisoned. But the effect was temporary. No one could stop what had been started. The working class was in open rebellion against the one-party state. 
The workers were not in power, as 64 years of communist propaganda tried to have us believe. They were imprisoned. Warsaw was a living proof. The decrepit gerontocracy of the Kremlin was a fitting image of the country and its system. Never had the gap been so pronounced between the surreal language of the ideal and the daily realities. The ideological varnish was beginning to crack. Belief in the superiority of the communist system was on the wane. As the image of the USSR began to fade, so did the memory of October 1917. And the more communist ideology was threatened, the more the Soviet Union showed its military might. The Red Army had a personnel of four million. The arms race with the US was eating up 30% of gross domestic product. The superpower was getting ready to attack. The more unattractive the model, the more the empire needed to expand. In 1980, the Red Army entered Afghanistan to hold up a pro-communist regime which was under threat. This war would provoke for young Russians the same traumas and rejection that Vietnam had caused in young Americans. Смешалась во сне грязь и пот и огонь, песни взрывы и дальние взрывы. Двадцать лет молодых оборвались войны, а ведь как они были красивы и встают с постели в холодном поту. И полночи курю на балконе, Только слезы в глаза, Только горечь во рту, А в ушах только ранен. The old guard was dying off. Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko fell in just three years. Дорогие товарищи, мы провожаем последний путь Константина Устиновича Черненко. When the young Gorbachev took over the party, he had already come to the conclusion that things couldn't go on as they were. Правдивый анализ должен помочь нам решать сегодняшние наши проблемы демократизации, законности, гласности, преодоления бюрократизма, словом, насущные проблемы перестройки. Перестройка не только избавление от застойности и консерватизма предшествующего периода, исправление допущенных ошибок, но и преодоление исторически ограниченных 
изживших себя черт общественной организации и методов работы. By launching Glasnost and Perestroika, Gorbachev unleashed a process he couldn't control. He wanted to create breathing space for the Soviet economy, to free it, decentralize it. In a word, he wanted to use his power as general secretary of the party to unburden the USSR from the party. But this was not the only contradiction of the plan. Glasnost was meant to revive the system, but in fact it sapped it. The required transparency on the past dealt a fatal blow to the ideological foundations laid 70 years before. The shock felt by revealing the truth destroyed the whole myth. The big lie was stripped bare. In truth, communism found transparency unsupportable. The movement started from the top by Gorbachev threw the country into turmoil. The Kremlin boss had tried, like Khrushchev and like Dubček in Czechoslovakia, to reform communism. This time, though, there was no stopping it. Gorbachev refused the use of force. This time, the satellite states knew the Red Army would not intervene. Poland was the loose thread that started unraveling, in just a few months, the whole Soviet empire. In Warsaw, East Berlin, Prague, Bucharest, Budapest, communism just simply fell apart. Социализм должен быть изгнан с территории Советского Союза. Первое. И второе. Не считаете ли вы, как это считает фракция беспартийных депутатов РСФСР, что коммунистическая партия Советского Союза должна быть расформирована как преступная организация? Ну что же, вопрос поставлен предельно откровенной форме, отвечаю, предельно откровенной форме. 
Если вы поставите задачу перед Верховным Советом и правительством Российской Федерации и даже перед всеми Верховный Совет правительства изгнать социализм из территории Советского Союза, то эту задачу нам не удастся с вами решить. Товарищи, для разрядки решите подписать указ о приостановлении деятельности российской компартии. Борис Николаевич, Борис Николаевич, Борис Николаевич. The communist faith was dead. The quest for a different society, based on the messianic message of communism since October 1917, disappeared along with the red flag flying over the Kremlin. But who can keep man from dreaming? Dreaming of changing his world. What does it mean to be communist? What does it mean to be? What was it? Teorie sbagliate, non applicabili nel corso degli anni, nello sviluppo della società così come è venuta o proprio veramente non giuste. Applicate male, sono gli uomini che le hanno applicate male. Io sinceramente faccio molta, ho molta confusione. Confusione, dolore, tante domande, tante... Ma soprattutto sono queste. Quello che potrà divenire ora, quello che potrà essere, lo staremo a vedere. Però per me il punto è proprio questo, quello che, è stato questi, quello che sono stati questi 40 anni di storia. Nei paesi dell'est, dove chi aveva il potere in mano era comunista e dove quasi tutto si è rivelato a discapito della gente del popolo, voglio dire. Con chi lavoreremo e lotteremo e per chi lavoreremo e lotteremo. Io in questo momento mi sento di non, non mi sento di riprendere la tessera del Partito Comunista, ma non perché c'è Occhetto ha detto di cambiare... Proprio perché la parola comunismo per me ha perso il suo significato vero e reale, quello che mio padre mi aveva insegnato.